Nice to be here. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I had one heck of a time getting out of the Federal Republic of New Jersey last night, so I'm very happy to be back in Cambridge. Uh, it was uh, not easy to get here, but it was worth it. There are many friends in this room, and I could begin by literally going across the front row and naming all of them, but I want to give a particular shout out to my very dear friend, Peter Amon. And I would say as someone, in my case, who came to diplomacy later in life and did not, as you wisely did, choose it as a career, how special, how unique, how exceptional is it to live the dream of your last six years as a diplomat, three as the German ambassador in Washington, and then three as the German ambassador in London, arguably the posts number one and two of that one aspires to in our line of business. And Peter, you've done a great job here. We're going to miss you. Um, but you've just done an exceptional job. So nice to be with you, buddy. Let's hear it for Peter. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Rolf Schutter, who's here as the German Consul General in Boston, a particularly good friend of my son Josh's. Rolf, it's very good to be with you. Uh, we know each other from our Berlin days, interesting times in Berlin these days, uh, and it's great to be with you. And again, I could, Georg, Helena, many others here say it's wonderful to be among friends. I also want to give a shout out to the McCloy fellows and the MPP candidates, um, Leia, uh, Mirko Gunther, Mitya Müller, and others who, who tolerated my uh, getting ready to be here today, so I appreciate you and your colleagues and, and your friendship. I also want to say Carl Kaiser is here. Carl, where are you? Carl is a dear friend. We just had the a great pleasure of having breakfast together with several of the leading faculty members of the German department here at Harvard, and we had a fascinating uh, discussion. And Carl and Guido Goldman, who had the good sense to be in Miami today, uh, while well, Carl was slogging it in from Concord, Mass, and I was coming up from New Jersey, our dear friends who have uh, continued to help connect me to Harvard, my alma mater. It's hard to believe I graduated 35 years ago, and I don't get back here that often. So I thank you, Carl, for organizing breakfast this morning, and I thank Leah and her colleagues for having me today to speak. I'd like to um, perhaps dispute the premise of the title of this conference, if I could. You probably won't be surprised by that. I didn't hear Peter's remarks, but my guess is he disputed them as well. The US and Germany drifting apart. I, I don't see that. I think maybe uh, if I were to put a title uh, on where things stand today, I think it could be the US and Germany entering a new dimension. That's sort of what I would feel more comfortable with. And a new dimension doesn't necessarily mean it's a better dimension or a worse dimension. But I will tell you, in some respects, if not in many, I will predict on this Valentine's Day 2014 that when we leg out another, I don't know, somewhere between one and five years, I'm going to predict to you that taken as a whole, the German-American relationship is going to be closer than than it is now and not more distant. That's my operating thesis. And not because I'm naive, uh, I'm a wide-eyed optimist, which I am, but because I think the facts will bear that out. So what I'd like to propose to do, Leo, with your blessing, is to make 10 brief observations about the state of the German-American relationship, and I will keep it brief, some of which are directly related, like point number one, which I'll get to in a second others of which are more contextual, and then I'd love to take as much time as you have for questions and discussions and dispute, and I'll bet you, particularly in the front row, there'll be a couple of people who won't see things quite the same way I do. So here goes. Let's get NSA on the table in point number one. There's no reason to let that drift uh, into the question and answer period. It's serious. Peter knows better than I do. It's taken seriously in both capitals, in both countries, and indeed, in other countries, but my remit is Germany and America. It is a matter of trust. Let there be no doubt about that. I think if you read the German press every day, as I do through summaries, or the US press, as I do literally, there is, in fairness, an imbalance 
of outrage at the moment. If you, if you accept that the press is a reasonable barometer for the substantive uh, outrage that lies beneath the press, I think there's no question about that. And as one of uh, our senators said something, and I'm paraphrasing him, it's a unique event that requires a unique solution. So unlike many diplomatic kerfuffles that Peter and I have been involved with, there's no, you don't go to the shelf and pull off C4 or F2 and plug it in here. This is a very unique, challenging, multidimensional uh, crisis. It requires something tangible. People have to be able to say, listen, I got, we got the following. And as I've said to many people, the following could be written in crayon. It's not clear to me what the following is, and it's not clear to me that it's necessarily important as to what it is. But it is necessary that something tangible comes out of this. And of course, this has been a little bit exacerbated, although this has come and gone, by my former colleague and friend, Toria Newland, who made the comments that she made about the Ukraine, or about, about Ukraine, not the Ukraine, about Ukraine last week. And that caused particular and understandably particular consternation in many capitals, including in Berlin. I know Toria well. I don't know that I know anyone in our government who understands and embraces the power of, of Europe more than Toria. Let there be no doubt about that. You know, I, I was thinking to myself, this is a little bit like a group of houses. We live in a dead end street in New Jersey, and, and I'm thinking, okay, there's a security crisis in our neighborhood. This a cat's gone missing or two houses have been broken into or something. And we want to work with the town and have them, you know, in, increase the frequency, say, of police uh, visits to the street. And, you know, I'm, I'm having a conversation with my wife or my son or somebody and they say, well, listen, the neighborhood association isn't quite there yet on what they want. And my response is, you know, screw the neighborhood so association. Let's get the town to do X right now. And that's the spirit. Uh, I believe we're going to find that that was uh, in the context that said, that doesn't mean you don't love your neighbors or you don't need your neighbors and you don't respect them. But come on, let's go. I got to get this going. This crisis, the NSA crisis will pass. Will, will pass. It must pass, by the way, and it will pass. And this is the first prediction that I suspect there'll be some disagreement on here. We will be closer at the end of this than we were at the beginning. I completely believe that. Reminds me of so many examples over the years between countries, between institutions, between friends. You say, you know what, I'm never going to get this friendship. It's never going to recover from this dispute, from this argument. This is horrible. We'll never get back to par. And more often than not, you end up closer than you were before you started. And that's my prediction. My second observation is on energy. We have two extraordinary revolutions going on on each side of the Atlantic, each with enormous risk, each with environmental risk, each with huge implications in terms of investment, jobs, industrial future. There's also a knock-on impact, indirect question as to what it does to the U.S.'s role globally. This is an area we may dispute uh, any observations about how the NSA scandal will end and the extent to which we're close or not, closer or not at the end of that. There is no question in my mind that at least measured by the amount of German investment into the United States and jobs created by German parent companies, there will be a meaningful, and I would almost use the word quantum, leap forward over the next five to 10 years as a result of the energy revolutions that are going on on each side in each of our two countries. That's not necessarily a good thing for industrial Germany, by the way. It's likely a huge boon on the American side. And remember, when companies make decisions to invest in America, and I'll look at it through the lens of German co co companies, but you could probably plug in any country you wish to, to uh, make this observation, you first decide to sell things into the United States 
because it's the biggest consumer market in the world and the largest economy. You then take the next decision to make things in the United States because you think getting closer to the consumer and their tastes will mean something. It's now gone to a different realm. It's already begun with the car companies that actually the United States is a good place to export product to, to certain parts of the world, particularly South America and Asia. It's now about to go beyond that, that this might be the place where we build our global product brand X, not just for America, not just for export to South America or Asia, but to the world. And that has huge implications. I mentioned the indirect question of whether or not it impacts the United States presence in the world, th this being the, the uh, so-called Schiffa Gaswende, the fracking uh, revolution. And my strong answer would be no. We are where we are in the world for a whole host of reasons. Energy is typically overrated as one of those reasons. People still, in my last days in Berlin, people would come up and say, of course you guys triggered the Iraq war because of access to energy. And let's put aside what any of us believe about the Iraq war, that wasn't on the list. So I think people, because they overrate energy, they overweight it as a factor for the US presence in the world, draw conclusions that will turn out to be false. And I have to say, this is not one of my 10 observations, but I have to say something quite revolutionary is going on as it relates to the German manufacturing presence in the United States. I believe, Peter, as we speak, the UAW is soliciting their votes in the Chattanooga plant. I believe the vote ends today, so it's Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And that is a potentially huge game changer. It is. Uh, establishment of a union has been uh, acknowledged as a step, the required, necessary, but not sufficient step in order to establish a works council at a, at a U.S. plant in the sort of German tradition. And I would just say as a parenthetical, if that succeeds, and it succeeds in a way that works both for workers and for Volkswagen, that could have huge implications on further investment in the United States beyond anything that energy could dictate. My third observation, TTIP. Progress this year is essential. And you'd, if you read this morning's press, both in the United States and in Germany, you would draw the conclusion that progress this year, while perhaps essential, will be impossible. Whether it's Harry Reid in the US Senate or a comment, I think it was in the Süddeutsche, Georg would know better than I, today that suggested that the, the interlocutors on the German or European side are now of the, of the opinion that they may not get a deal during President Obama's administration. This is these negotiations of which I suspect many here have been involved and are, are stu students of the game of, are a uh, a very sophisticated dance. And admittedly, sometimes they don't work out. Many times they do. But you draw uh, one, th one lesson that one draws from trade negotiations, and this is a lesson I took from someone who's an expert at this, is that if you, draw, if, if you take a snapshot of these negotiations at any moment in time, as opposed to taking the movie and looking at it over time, you are likely to draw the wrong conclusion. And so certainly, if you, if you read what Senator Reid said a couple of weeks ago about fast track authority, you might say, you know what, that's likely dead. Because if they have to go through Congress, and Congress has the ability to add amendments and, and take away amendments to a trade deal, it'll never get done. It'll be the ultimate Christmas tree. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that snapshot to the bank. I think Peter would agree with me on this. And then if you hear things on the... European and German specific side, you could draw a similar conclusion. I think one piece of very good news is cooler heads have prevailed to date in keeping the NSA challenge, which is a challenge which both sides take seriously, compartmentalized from the TTIP negotiations, and that's the way it has to stay. They're both serious, but they have to be kept and dealt with in their own lanes. Why is TTIP so essential? It's jobs, period, full stop. 
Neither in Europe nor in the United States is there any appetite to put big FDR-like stimulus programs, fiscal stimulus programs, through our legislatures. It's just not going to happen. The U.S. economy is recovering at a faster pace than in Europe, clearly, but our unemployment rate is stubbornly too high. And as high as it is in Europe, it's at least five percentage points higher. There are not a lot of available low-hanging fruit to jumpstart the job market on either side, and this is one of them. The Bertelsmann Foundation put a report out a couple of months ago that I believe said about 750,000 jobs in the United States created, including in all 50 states, dramatic increase in exports. It's a big deal, and, and the upside in Europe is at least that. Let's also not forget, this is a question for the next decade to 50 years of who sets the standards. So the opportunity is not just first and foremost for Europeans and Americans. When you combine the number one economy in the world with the number one economic bloc in the world, and they set the standards, those standards are the standards for global commerce. Period. One of the risks of failure here is that the standards will get set for us. And think about that as it relates to environmental standards, intellectual property rights, workers' rights, to pick three. So the question is when we're really frustrated with each other, and I guarantee you we are and we will be when you're in a negotiating, when you're negotiating a trade deal, let's remember that very important consequence. Either we set the intellectual property, environmental, workers' rights standards, or somebody sets them for us. This is going to be like everything else in life. If this is the spectrum of human behavior, and here is acting in one's cold-blooded immediate self-interest, and here is acting in one's long-term enlightened interests, the more the negotiations coalesce in this neighborhood, the more likely we're going to have success. And that means if you're a country, a state in our union, an industry group, if, if we are living over here in these negotiations, they will not succeed. We must be, we must have sort of the same global vision as so many important Germans and Americans had in the late 1940s and early 1950s that saw beyond what's in my immediate self-interest. Fourth observation, and these will be shorter ones. There's a raging debate, I find this quite interesting, on both sides of the Atlantic regarding inequality of income and inequality of opportunity. In Europe, and I'm drawing broad sweeping conclusions, it is largely member state versus member state. In the United States, it's not. So this is not a big debate today, Massachusetts versus Kentucky. In my state of New Jersey, the statistic that does it best, encapsulates it best for me is in public education. New Jersey ranks annually among the top states in our country as it relates to the quality of the public schools. And the last survey I saw, I think it was fourth. I, and I'm, I'm proud to say as a product of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a member of the Red Sox nation, I think Massachusetts perennially ranks number one. But number four ain't bad. But New Jersey also leads the nation in dispersion of public school experience. In other words, between those that have an outstanding experience and those that have an un unacceptable experience. And it is a perennial leader in that respect. And when you look at the elections, the overwhelming support in elections of Senator Elizabeth Warren here, or Mayor Bill de Blasio in New York, you start to sense, you know what, there's something going on here. People are screaming out, they're mad as hell, they're not going to take it anymore. And this has got to work, our success has to work for a broader swath of society. And the question is, how do we all see that from our various perspectives? Will those that have succeeded view it in their interests to have a broader, more holistic approach to the economy, to poverty, 
to inequality of income or opportunity. There's a very interesting piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago. You may have seen it. This also gets back, by the way, to your cold-blooded immediate self-interest versus your long-term enlightened self-interest, which to the students here I think is a good, if I may be so humble, a good measure for you to always measure your actions in life. But the article observed that many of this, you know, mid, mid, middle class typically bought appliances weren't selling. That a lot of companies were vacating the space and having to, having to engineer and sell far more sophisticated for a wealthier consumer products. And that is not therefore, and they reference General Electric, I'll just pick them as one example, that's not in General Electric's interests. So a big, successful middle class, in my opinion, is the, is the, is, is the success point, the key can punct for a successful society. And we're seeing that same dynamic play out across Europe. Germany just raised its expected economic performance this year, I note, from 1.7% to 1.8%. It's not much, but it's growing. To what extent is its growth impacted by its trading reality inside of Europe, in particular with member states that are shrinking still or flatlining? And to what extent is it in Germany's enlightened self-interest to take actions which at first pass may look like they are completely in the benefit of the lagging member states? but in the longer run is clearly also in Germany's benefit. I would give Germany relatively high marks for seeing that, 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 that horizon, that this is not just about what's good for this year in Greece or Italy or Portugal, but that over a decade or more, this is good not just for those member states and their people, and it needs to be, but also for the broader Europe, including and specifically in Germany. Next, I'm quite struck by recent debates and speeches on both sides of the Atlantic about foreign policy and collective security. I wasn't in Munich, but President, Bundespräsident Gauck's speech, which I've read in its entirety, was quite striking. I think almost, I would say, quite historical and amplified by ministers von der Leyen and Steinmeier. And I, I'm certain welcomed wholeheartedly with open arms by the United States government. This was a statement that was made that captured responsibility in today's 21st century world and not just an economic responsibility. And at the same time those remarks were playing out you had in Secretary Kerry in Munich, but more broadly, you've had this question which is on the tips of people's tongues lately. What about the United States? Is the United States still as engaged as it was or, it need, as, or as it needs to be? And perhaps are these pronouncements by the Germans at the very highest level prompted in part by a sense that there's a void that needs to be filled at least in part by Germany's presence? I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way at all. I think people who judge the level of the US engagement do so through a 1985 NATO lens. And with all due respect, we're in a different world. NATO's still important, but the lens in 2014 is a lot different than it used to be. So my takeaway from each of these impulses, one is this strong statement at the highest levels by Germany about responsibility in a collective security sense. And this question of whether or not the United States is still engaged, I actually think this is a one plus one equals three moment. This is a good thing. This is another area where in this new dimension of our relationship, we're converging and not diverging. And again, I give enormous credit for all the frustrations we may have at the moment with President Karzai in Afghanistan. I give enormous credit, and I know our government does, to Germany and its staying power, its willingness to be part of an ongoing solution through all this frustration as one example. So I walk away from that 
security discussion actually quite encouraged. My next observation is that there's an interesting convergence of political realities in each of our countries right now. And the sense that even you would have from a year ago has become stale if you were to examine our domestic political contours. In Germany, it's happened through an election. So I can't, I, I can only remember countless Bundestag votes on various European bailout measures or on the mission in Afghanistan or some other foreign policy question. And many of those elections were cliffhangers by one, two, five votes. Always the question, would you get a Kanzler Mehrheit or not? There's a very different dynamic today going on for obvious reasons in a grand coalition than there was a year ago. And likewise, not yet through elections, but through political behavior, the sense that one got during most of my time in Berlin, the Germans had, and rightfully, that the US was over indebted, lived on deficits, and found itself constantly in political gridlock. And chip by chip, step by step, that's become a rather stale notion. The level of indebtedness remains high. It's hard not to call $17 trillion high. There's no question it's high. But if you've been watching the deficit reality, and by the way, it's simple math and it's how this thing works in life, the deficits get cleaned up before the debt levels get cleaned up. And if you look at the level of deficit in the United States government over the past couple of years, it's come down dramatically. And as for stalemate, much of it, I'm a card-carrying Democrat, but I say this not in a partisan way, much of the stalemate revolved around the fact that you had a Republican Party that was really split in two. So it was a party in name only. That's begun to also get stale. You look at things from the Violence Against Women Act. You look at a budget passing. You look at a clean bill to, for the debt ceiling to get raised. And you start to see what we were all predicting a couple of years ago, that when your popularity rank rankings, or when, you, when the polls say your, your favorable rating is at 9%, as Senator McCain has said, once you get through family and staff, you don't need many more people to get you to 9% you start to behave differently. Now the reason the Republican Party for our German friends hasn't behaved more quickly sooner as they've lost, let's, let's remember this is a party that's lost by popular vote five of the last six presidential elections. One of, the, one of those they won through the Electoral College. You'd think you'd see more change and more change quickly, but the House of Representatives, again for our German friends, is a completely different political reality than the presidency. And those elections get decided in a very different, unique way. Frankly, as an American, I would say not, not in a good way. But it's the way it is. These districts have been, to use a, a wonderful word, gerrymandered by state houses and governors. And so the, what, what the Republican and Democratic Party, this is a reality for both parties, look at in a midterm election in November and what drives that election is very different than the one that drives a presidential election two years from now. I would just, if you ask me my one hope for, for 2014, I would hope that Speaker Boehner had the courage to push back on the Tea Party cohort on immigration reform as he has on the budget, violence against women, the debt ceiling, and that he would come out from behind an absurd excuse that he can't trust President Obama to secure the borders. Absolute absurd uh, accusation. Let's see him have the courage, and I think he's a good American, a good man with German roots, I might add. Let's see him have the courage on immigration that he started to show elsewhere. It would be good for his party, and more importantly, it would be good for America. Almost done here. My next observation is that too many of our institutions, NATO, EU, Brussels as a location, Washington as a location, even the notion of the German-American relationship 
have, been, have become frighteningly abstract, easy to attack, easy to ignore, in particular by young people. All of those institutions in those cities and relationships have to find, get back on the edge of their seat, find their rhythm, find their momentum. Again, particularly for young people. Carl and I had breakfast, uh, as I mentioned, with three professors from the German department today. And just to pick on that, and Helena, you would have been proud of me because we've talked about this since the first day you and I met. Rolf, this is for you and Peter as well. Too few kids in this country take German, period. There are too few high schools. One of the professor's sons went to Arlington High, goes to Arlington High School. They, they said they're gonna start offering German. Terrific, he showed up on day one. He was handed a set of Rosetta Stone tapes and said a report back in a month. We have two children in prep school. They picked the school they're in in large part because of the German department, but some of the best high schools in America that they looked at no longer offer German. And if I were the former US ambassador to Russia, I believe I'd be saying the same thing right now about Russian. It sounds simple, and it kills the State Department. It hurts relations between Germany and America. And for all the exchange programs, I think there's no city in the world right now that a Harvard student would rather be in than Berlin. That's the good news. But too many of them are in Berlin speaking English. That's got to change. Exchange programs for the youth are the absolute holy grail. The correlation between a meaningful exchange program, a year is better than a half, but a half is better than three months, and three months is better than eight weeks, and eight weeks is better than nothing. The correlation between that exchange experience and what that kid feels, hopefully a kid, we get them when they're young, feels about that country is a thousand percent correlated that that stays with that person for the rest of their lives. They speak the language, they take their families there when they grow up on vacation, they might even work there. We've got to get that back. I worry about off-cycle elections and how they're amplified. I worry about the European parliamentary elections coming up, where there's these so-called low turnout elections, where the passion, and unfortunately a lot of the passion right now in Europe is not positive passion as it relates to the European project. And again, Brussels is easy to shoot at. Washington is easier to shoot at if you're a politician. Midterm elections in Congress, same thing, low turnout elections. Again, I'm not taking sides here, I'm just, as a matter of fact, it was easy for the Tea Party, given the environment in our country, to score the wins they got in 2010. Because you didn't have the top of the ticket First U.S. president re-elected since I don't know when with 51% of the, of, the, of the vote twice. You didn't have him running at the top. I don't know what the turnout in the Swiss elections were. Were they high or low? Anyone know? But that's also Switzerland of all places. Look at the impulses. Look at the implications from that. Again, it's too easy to caricature today. Too easy to demonize particularly institutions that I would bet would be in wild agreement matter. It's in all of our interest to make sure that they matter in 2014, not just that they mattered 30 years ago. Another observation. I've thought about this a lot, Peter. For all that Germany and America do together, we do very little together in Asia or in Latin America. So on my list of trying to find ways to make sure that my do, new dimension means that we're closer and not farther apart, further apart rather, over the next 10 years, I, if I were king for a day, I think I'd find something other than pure cold-blooded commerce, which is typically what, uh, what we're, at least in part of our ex external selves about. I'd love to think there's a project that we could work on at an official government-to-government -government level in Asia. Now we're focused and we have been since the 40s on security in Asia and we also have commercial and diplomatic interests. Germany has been wildly successful in its commercial interests and it's done some extraordinarily important diplomatic bridge building. Where is, where is a new area? And by the way, I'm not, I'm, I don't have all the answers. Maybe it's not in Asia. 
I have a feeling it's not in, in, in South America. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's in art. I'd give a big shout out to my friend Monica Gluders, who's made enormous strides over the past couple of months in heavy weather on this whole uh, art question, looted art question. Maybe there's, but again, if I were advising, if I had our two governments in a room together, advising them on how they would go forward in the next 10 years to prove tangibly that they're even closer together than they used to be, on my list of to-dos would be to find an area where they have not typically worked together. For my taste right now, there is a surfeit of moving parts and wild cards in our world. And the list is long, and you know them better likely than I do. It would start, it would begin with things like Syria. How do we figure this crazy Af Afghanistan puzzle out with Karzai? Middle East peace, Iran, which direction that goes. All these wild cards have big implications on the German-American relationship. In almost all of them, we work cheek to jowl with overwhelmingly similar values and objectives. Ukraine would be on that list in terms of where we want to see things end up. I could give you a laundry list of 10 of these, but I would just observe two that I think if we gather again on Valentine's Day in 2015, it will be very interesting to see how these two evolve over the next 12 months. One is this combination of China's slowing demand, domestic demand, and central bank action, first and foremost the U.S. Fed, but not limited only to that, and the, and the impact of those two trends taken together. This feels to me, and I'm putting my banker's hat on, which I was before I became a diplomat, it has a sense of 94, 97, 98 to it. And in financial markets, those are not years that are in the Hall of Fame. Uh, may we wish that those years don't get repeated in 2014. This year is off to a rough start in that respect. Janet Yellen, in her first uh, testimony earlier this week, made it quite clear, as she should, I, I think, her first and foremost responsibility is for the U.S. economy, regardless of whatever implications there might be for the global economy. Emerging markets, far more so than Europe, and by the way, I'm putting the ECB, the Euro, and Europe aside for a moment, uncharacteristically, which is obviously still a project where the, the, the boat is halfway across the river, but it has a ways to go to get there, and it will get there, by the way. I'm putting that aside for a moment, and I'm looking merely at U.S. action, collective central bank action, and impact on places like China, Brazil, India, South Africa, Mexico, etc. My second wild card that I'm watching carefully, and I could have picked many, is Turkey. Where will Turkey be a year from today? Where will its relationship be with the European Union a year from today? Better, worse? You know, a few years ago, it felt like the Turkish economy could do no wrong. One of my former uh, Wall Street colleagues told me, this is, you all, many have heard this, I'm sure, if you get into a taxi cab and the taxi cab driver is talking about stocks and stock tips, sell every stock you have. <laughs> Nothing against taxi drivers. That happened to me once. I got into a, a, a taxi in Saudi Arabia, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and the entire ride to the airport in Riyadh was about the Saudi stock market and what did I like and what didn't I like. And boy, I wanted to short the Saudi market. I couldn't find a way to do it. Turns out I would have been right. And we don't, you don't wish that on people, by the way. That's not a pleasant thing. But it is a reality, unfortunately. And a few years ago, maybe even a year or two ago, when it felt like the Turkey, Turkish stock market wasn't going to ever come down, and the economy was never going to slow down, and everything was going sort of monolithically in one direction, that just doesn't happen in the world. It didn't happen with Japan. It, didn't hap it won't happen with China. And again, we, you'd be careful what we wish for. We all would have been, be we would have been better off if Japan had grown at 2 or 3% a year since 1989. Let there be no doubt. The Japanese would have been better off, but the global economy would have been better off. And we should wish all of us for China 
to have soft transitions between booms and busts and that it moves along a trajectory in the right direction. And certainly Turkey uh, and any, any country that matters. But I, I'm very curious to see where Turkey is a year from now. In my last comment, and Leah, you helped me uh, tee this one up, is of course, natürlich über Fußball. So I note that Germany and the US are together in Group G <laughs> with Portugal and Ghana. So I'll give you my prediction. Please write this down and reconvene on July 13th. Germany will win the group. I believe they'll go undefeated in the group. The US will come in second place. Please. <laughs> now, I know for all of you Cristiano Ronaldo fans and the other outstanding Portuguese footballers, you're going to argue that Portugal is going to come in second place. And my response will be, absolutely, they're better footballers than, than our guys. But they're not a better team. We play better as a team. First and foremost, Jürgen Klinsmann, natürlich aus Stuttgart. The bigger question for me is Ghana. The answer, to, unfortunate answer to the trivia question, which team has eliminated the U.S. the past two World Cups? The answer is Ghana, 06 and 2010. I think that's a bigger challenge. Brazil will beat Spain for third place, and Germany will beat Argentina for the World Cup championship. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Is this mine? I'm told by the way we have time for two questions. Sir, I, if you stand up, I can hear you. First of all, I told you a gay guy would offend you, so you're leaving now. Jakob Schroth with the Young Transatlantic Is this on here? Yeah. With the Young Transatlantic Initiative, Ambassador Murphy, thank, first of all, thank you very much for staying committed to the German American friendship and soccer, of course. Um, you touched on civic relations between America and, and Germany, and that's what my question kind of points to. The German embassy released a study that shows that Americans apparently think that Germany is kind of a paradise. So, German public standing in America is very good. On the other hand, of the Atlantic Ocean, studies like from the German Marshall Fund or from the Einsbach Institute show that the average German, whoever is the average German, that the public standing of America is rapidly declining in terms of culture, in terms of education, not only in terms of global leadership. So if 12% of Germans think that the average German American is educated and the rest does not think so, what can we do to change that? Because apparently we can't send all 80 million Germans for a study exchange to Harvard. Uh, from Dresden. Dresden. Okay. Dinamo. Dinamo Dresden. <laughs> Don't laugh out there, guys. They're going to come back. First of all, I, I would say in these polls, we make a huge mistake. As I mentioned, if you're looking at a trade negotiation, you make a huge mistake to take a snapshot and assess the, the uh, draw your conclusion based on a static reality, a static moment. These polls are the same darn thing. I'll give you an observation on both sides of it. Carl and I were talking about this at breakfast. I'm going to say between 95 and 2010, 2008, 9, 10, somewhere in there, Germany as a brand went from being everything we were obsessed about through the lens of America to sort of getting lost in the midst of other brands. And whether it's for good or bad reason, but the fact that Angela Merkel, and this is a great reason, is the last standing leader in Europe has been re elected three times to her enormous credit. The Euro crisis, the gapping out of the German economic performance relative to the rest of Europe, but even relative to France. Unfortunately and sadly, NSA, whatever the reason, Germany's back on the front page of the newspapers, largely with good effect, largely first and foremost beginning with the Chancellor who herself is very popular in the United States. So Germany's got its mojo back. It was very easy in 1985 to put a crisp assessment on Germany as it was on the Soviet Union for different reasons, but both related to the Cold War. Germany's got that momentum back. I saw the same results. I was very happy that Americans 
were savvy enough to have drawn that conclusion. Herr General, wie geht es? Nice to see you. Um, on the other side, German Marshall Fund polls in several countries uh, uh, attitudes about America. They do it every June. In June of 2008, so this is, and they released it in September, released in September of 2008. What do you think of the President of the United States? Again, I'm not drawing conclusions one side or the other here, just objective facts. 12% support. So in June of 2008, the same number of Germans thought that George Bush, thought highly of George Bush, as apparently now they think uh, that we're educated. In June of 2009, Released in September of 2009, guess what Barack Obama's numbers were? 92, up a modest 80%. Numbers he could have used in Ohio in both elections. You know what? Next year it's gonna be a different number. There's no, I've determined there's no rhyme or reason. It's the personality of leaders. It's the topic of the day. As I said about NSA, there's clearly a disproportionate outrage between our two countries right now, and I'm certain that has something to do with these numbers. But I guarantee you, whatever the numbers are, they'll be different a year from now, hopefully on, on both sides better. But I repeat, the more time people like you get brought up in Dresden and find your way to Cambridge, and likewise, folks from Cambridge find their way to Dresden, the better and more sustained those numbers will be. How about somebody else? In the way back, sir. If you shout, stand up, I can hear you. I can just tell this is going to be tough. Um, so whenever I hear American politicians talk, they say Germany and Europe and the US have to figure out the NSA crisis together. And my question is really, what is Germany supposed to figure out? I mean, it's not like both sides may same mistakes, and really uh, my question is what uh, American diplomats are waiting for. Yeah, well, I, the answer to that, honestly, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, is I don't know, because I'm not there. I'm, I'm eight months um, uh, removed. But it's in both sides' interests, and they both understand that. So I said, I think the press would suggest the outrage is imbalanced, which I assume reflects also the underlying reality. I can't speak for the official government, inside government positions, but I'm certain that that speaks to some reality. So I'm not suggesting that the, the media in Germany is blowing this out of proportion. I, and I'm sure Georg would agree with that. This is a substantive issue that needs to get solved. The reason why both sides, it matters to both sides, is because there are people out there, and these are not, let's put aside this ridiculousness of, of we're all this together. As the president himself said, uh, when he was in Berlin in June, if I want to know what Angela Merkel's thinking, I pick up the phone and ask her. That's the German-American relationship that he knows and that I know from my experience. Let's put that aside for a moment. The reality is there are people out there who want to do harm to us, whether we like it or not. Harm to Germans and harm to Americans. And the level of cooperation between our two countries and between Europe and the United States more generally is really important for the safety, security, and well-being of our citizens. And we can't screw that up. By the same token, each side of the Atlantic cares deeply with great passion about civil liberty, about privacy and rights to privacy. It evidences itself in different ways. We have different histories. The German, recent German history, the past 100 years is overwhelmingly obvious in how that plays into Germany's passions. But it's not just about history. It's in our Bill of Rights. So this is, inst this, this is institutionalized. This is part of our core. But it isn't just in the Bill of Rights. It's how we live as Americans day in and day out. Getting that balance right, I think, is, I've come to determine, is the most complicated day in, day out task of leaders of free and open democracies like Germany and America. You're in a big piece of construction equipment with two levers that you wake up every day to try to get as precisely right as you can, and it's iterative. Things happen that 
throw your machine one direction or the other. Snowden is clearly one example of that. Unfortunately, acts of terrorism are another example of that. Um, and getting that right is so hard. And think about a society that throws all civil liberties and rights of privacy under the bus and focuses only on security. And there are examples of that today in the world. How would you feel about living in that society? And how would you feel if we threw security under the bus? And all we focused, and we ignored that, and we focused with great pride, I might add, on rights of privacy and civil liberties. How secure would we be? Unfortunately, in today's world, we'd have challenges. So getting that right is job number one. When you, when you become an ambassador, the, the, they, guys like me have to go to school for a couple months because we don't know where the men's room is. So you, gotta, you need a lot of training. And the first thing that's drilled into your head, and it's drilled into your head almost every day you're part of this, is the safety, security, and well-being of American citizens in your country is your number one responsibility. The safety, security, and well-being of your citizens delete in your country, period, is the number one responsibility for the American president. And that's what we're, that's the milieu we find ourselves in. That's why, again, I'm not, you, you raise a very good question. This is not a question of, wait a minute, who's at fault here? Let's get beyond that and say, okay, it's in both of our interests to get this calibrated really well. Throw the ridiculous stuff aside, which is science fiction to me. Let's get down to the hardcore of where our common interests are and how we can make our citizens feel free, genuinely, with the privacy that they deserve, and at the same time, secure. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit.